Sam Plum, also from Utah, brother of Andrew. Sam, thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me, and you're all to be commended for the work that you are um, that you're accomplishing. And the fact that when you say that it's a bipartisan issue, in reality, it, it's just not it's not a partisan issue whatsoever. No, it's right. it affects everyone. It's an equal opportunity employer. But nonetheless, I know that in in today's realm, it's it's great to see people working towards um, the right causes from across the aisle. Do you mind if I ask the crowd a question real quick? I'm happy with whatever you'd like how, to ask. How many of you here have a naloxone kit? So a pretty decent amount, okay. Does everybody know what naloxone is or Narcan? Okay, so, <clears throat> and I'll get to that. I, I prepared something brief as well and then um, I may go off the cuff a bit, but uh, I was introduced to addiction at a very young age. There were 12 years between my brother Andy and I, and I cannot begin to describe to you the adoration I had for him. He was so full of life. His energy was contagious. He was handsome, so funny, and epically kind. He would include me in, the mo he would include me in most anything, take me on adventures, play video games. He was everything that a little brother could hope for. I remember the night that my brother died, which was also the first and only time I would see my father cry. As the only hero I had ever known was overdosing on opiates and slowly dying, his friends left him in the basement, buried the paraphernalia and remaining drugs in the front yard, and left. My brother died 20 years ago on the 14th of May. I was nine years old. Andy was a middle-class kid from the suburbs, and heroin was a big problem then. When I hear people say heroin is now in the suburbs, I know a different reality. This is not new. The problem has continued to grow since his death and has grown to be a public health threat of epi epidemic proportion in every setting. Utah, my home, is now fourth in the nation for its rate of overdose deaths and first in the nation for overdose deaths in the veteran population across the nation. If my brother or his friends would have had access to naloxone, I have no doubt that his life would have been saved the night of May 14th, 1996. This is true for those overdosing in the state of Utah and across the nation today. Given the, the death of my brother and after watching the frustrating efforts of our parents to create positive change in the aftermath, my sister and I were determined to do more. I myself am an employee of the University of Utah Department of Pediatrics and a co-founder of an organization called Utah Naloxone, which is also housed within the Department of Pediatrics. The mission of our organization can be described simply as a rescue mission. We are empowering others to save the lives of people around them, people who do not deserve to die a preventable death. Substance use disorder and addiction are diseases, and those suffering should not be viewed or treated as, a, as deserving of a death sentence, especially in our country where even the most heinous of crimes that um, capital punishment is something that, that is considered or can happen. It takes 15 to 20 years uh, God knows how many expenses, and here we're willing to say that addiction should be a death sentence. I, I, I find that hard to believe. On July 1st, 2015, we founded Utah Naloxone with the goal of preventing unnecessary deaths from opiate and opioid overdoses. Utah Naloxone has been in operation for just over 10 months, distributing over 1,900 free naloxone rescue kits with 60 rescues that we know of from our kits alone. So that's 60 lives saved in the span of 10 months. And we aren't talking emergency room, EMS, first responders. These are people in the public. We focus our efforts on increasing public awareness about and access to naloxone throughout the state of Utah. While we have made great progress in our efforts and the Utah legislature and U.S. House have passed progressive bills to combat this epidemic, we have a lot more work to accomplish. Naloxone is an expensive medication and the prices continue to rise. Many medical providers are not aware of naloxone access laws or are unwilling to prescribe or dispense this medication to those who could benefit from having it. The funding pool for naloxone distribution programs is not only small, but it is also incredibly competitive. While law enforcement entities and government organizations play an important role in the fight against overdose death nationwide, evidence and experience have shown that the largest impact comes from the funding of community organizations that are actively involved with at-risk populations. Simply put, if given the resources, organizations like Utah Naloxone can and do save lives. Our rescues co have come in any setting you can imagine. 
They have been from mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, wives, husbands, sons, best friends, and even from relative strangers. Empowering the broader community to save the lives of those around them and those they love is the key to stemming the tragic loss of life due to overdose. These lives matter. And one thing that is very important to realize is that while these, the different portions of CARA and all of the house bills that have passed are being implemented, there are most definitely going to be speed bumps. There, are, there is going to be a learning curve that we already know is tremendously high. And what often happens, and what I've heard from, from family members talking about loved ones they've lost, is even the folks that do have resources or do have venues to get into treatment, if you get that time when, when somebody who's an active user says, I'm ready, I want to get into treatment, and then they're told that it could be anywhere from seven days to three weeks until they can get in, or you get them detoxed and then there's a week before they can get in, those are the people that are most highly at risk for, for an overdose death. Um, you, you talk about the, the, um, the fetal withdrawal, I, I didn't um, pronounce it correctly, but uh, another thing that we are seeing tremendously in Utah is mothers who quit while they have their babies. And after they give birth, it's not long after that, they go back to heroin or oxys, which honestly to me, while they're, one's illicit and one's a prescription medication, one is pharmaceutical grade heroin, the other is street heroin. They're, they'll both kill you the same way. And to give you an idea of, of pediatrics and why that's so important is, you know, it doesn't matter if you're a mother, if you are a father, a brother, if, you, if a child loses somebody that they care about through addiction, then they are impacted directly and indirectly. And to give you just an anecdotal uh, story that is just truly powerful, we've, uh, we've trained um, five different law enforcement agencies in the state of Utah. We continue to do more. Um, we have distrib distribution points throughout the entirety of the state. Now again, remember, just two people have allowed for this to happen. Um, but Utah is very, they, we value our kids. Not as if other states don't, but if you go to Utah, it's almost crazy, right? And uh, one thing that we tell people is, you know, do you have pain medications in the home? Do you have small children in the home? And the answer is inevitably yes. And so um, Dr. Plum, who's the medical director, and my sister, um, she's also an emergency pediatrician. In four weeks at Primary Children's Hospital, we used to tell this horror story, four kids under the age of eight came in overdosed on pain medications found in the home. About two weeks ago, in one shift, now this is just the patients that she's seeing in one night in the emergency room, four kids under the age of four came in overdosed on pain medications found in the home. And if you think about all of the stories of, of parents finding their kids dead, or parents watching their kids dead, or that constant fear and lack of control, one thing that has been absolutely incredible about what we've heard from this is when a mother wakes her son up from an overdose, that she quite possibly could have prevented him from being in a vegetative state for the rest of his life if he was to survive by getting that oxygen to his brain. And for those children, children are curious. They're going to find things. There's no reason why this should not be readily available. And so if there were distribution programs, which there are, Chicago, the DOPE Project in San Francisco, Utah Naloxone in the state of Utah, but like many people have said, in 2014, the bills were passed in Utah. It wasn't until 2015, um, God knows how many meetings with the health department and different agencies, that we realized that nobody was doing anything. And still to this day, the state of Utah has not purchased one vial of naloxone. The health department has not purchased one vial of naloxone. And so really, you talk about action and you talk about things that can be done. This, what we've done in Utah is absolutely replicatable. It is not our project, it is our project. And I don't see any reason why this drug shouldn't be readily and easily accessible to all those who would like to have it. Great. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Sam. You did a great job. And uh, you're a wonderful advocate. Your sister should be very proud of you as well.